Um, all right, everybody, uh, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, welcome back to the Dharma Doors. Uh, I'm MC Owens. This is the San Francisco Dharma Collective. Um, and tonight, our little Dharma discussion. Um, tonight's theme or the topic that I plan to discuss and to read a little bit about. Tonight, I want to talk about or the theme is about what the Buddhists call leaving home. So this is sort of, um, well, let me tell you exactly kind of how it is that we've come to talk about this topic. So a number of even months ago now, weeks, months ago, I started reading on Sunday nights, a new sutra. We've been going through it slowly. And this sutra, it's, it's one of those Mahayana Buddhist sutras that kind of goes all over the place, a lot of little stories and all of that. But we've come to a point in the sutra where what we're hearing about is the life story of the Buddha. And it's going through the life story of Siddhartha or the Buddha. It's going through it point by point. And I mentioned last week that that as someone who tells the story of Siddhartha a lot, I also use all of these same bullet points in the life story of the Buddha to tell the story of Siddhartha. And our sutra is doing the same thing, except this sutra, which is a Mahayana Buddhist sutra, is doing something a little different with the life story of the Buddha. And this is an idea or, you know, it's a topic that I've brought up a few weeks ago. And what it was is, is that this sutra is treating the Buddha a little bit differently than we normally would find the Buddha being uh, talked about or treated. And what I mean is, is that I've been talking about how in the Mahayana Buddhist tradition, something very interesting happens. And what happens is, is that this person, Siddhartha Gautama of India from 500 BC or so, well, in the early form of Buddhism, what we call the Hinayana or that kind of early Buddhist path, the Buddha was the founder, <laughs> the 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 liberator, the person who turned the Dharma wheel. And so the Buddha in the early Buddhist tradition was revered as a, a guru teacher person in that way. And then even after he passed away, as I mentioned last week, he was cremated and they took the little bone fragments, the little relics, and gave them to everybody to spread all around. And then even those bone relics of the person become objects of reverence in the early Buddhist tradition. But something happens in the Mahayana tradition. And what happens is, is that rather than the life story of the Buddha, rather than it being history, or rather than it being the biography of the founder, in the Mahayana tradition, the life story of the Buddha becomes an archetypal journey. And it's an archetypal journey for the Bodhisattva. And this is a, one of the main topics that we've been talking about in the Dharma doors now for a very long time, which is sort of, I've been in a way talking about for oh, years now, I've been talking about the bodhisattva path, not what would be called the path of the arahat, the, that path of early Buddhism. We've been talking about the bodhisattva path. And the main thing, of course, about a bodhisattva is that they are not just going for individual personal liberation. A bodhisattva is going for 
universal liberation. So the liberation of all sentient beings, not just personal liberation. And that's sort of one of the major dividing lines or separations between early Buddhism and Mahayana Buddhism. Early Buddhism was a path of individual liberation versus this bodhisattva path, which has a much you know, loftier goal, if you will, because it's about trying to awaken or liberate all beings. And so a bodhisattva is someone who's invested in that project. And that project culminates in Buddhahood, in the bodhisattva becoming a buddha, an awakened being. And so I want to continue that conversation about the difference between the early form of Buddhism and the more Mahayana form of Buddhism. And in particular, then, what I want to emphasize is this. If you are on the Bodhisattva path, then all of a sudden, if, as I said, if the life story of the Buddha becomes the archetypal journey of a bodhisattva, what that means is, is that as a bodhisattva, we are looking to this story and we're going to be looking to the, the points of the sutra. We're going to be looking at those not in terms of what happened to the Buddha. We want to think about it in terms of what happens to a Buddha, if that makes sense. So again, not reading this as history, but reading it as archetypal, the archetypal journey in that sense. And so without going completely and recapping everything we've talked about, we've mainly been talking so far about the birth of the Buddha or the birth of Siddhartha. And this begins with the Bodhisattva entering the mother's womb and then exiting the mother's right side. And that sort of, and then last week we talked about these seven steps that the baby Buddha took, declaring that this will be their last rebirth. So my point is, is that we could then, if insofar as we are practicing Mahayana Buddhism, insofar as we are on the Bodhisattva path, we can now look to the archetypal journey and then look at our own lives. And we can recognize, hey, wait, I entered my mother's womb. <laughs> I exited my mother's womb. Hey, I, it sounds like I'm on the Bodhisattva path, or at least I've, I've got the first few steps underway, right? And so then that leads us to what I want to talk about tonight and what I'm going to read about more from the sutra, which is this idea of leaving home. So we, we have a few more things to talk about in the sutra, but the focus tonight is about this idea of of leaving home. So for a, just a quick recap, just to contextualize what we're talking about, as most of you know, Buddhism began as a forest dwelling path of renunciation. And what that meant was that in the seemingly, at least based upon the literature, in the lifetime of the Buddha, to be a Buddhist, to follow the Buddha, meant that you left home. <laughs> and of course, in the early form of Buddhism, they meant that very literally. And what I, what I mean is, is that they were talking about, in the early tradition, essentially taking up a life of homelessness, what we would call uh, being unhoused, being homeless, you know, the, that idea of not owning a house or a shelter and basically 
making a commitment to wander. That was the early Buddhist path. Now, there were other aspects, of course, to leaving home, which included things like shaving your head twice a month, um, giving up all of your clothing, giving up all your personal possessions, and only wearing a three-part robe. And robe is actually a generous term <laughs> because in the early days of Buddhism, you, you were given three rectangular sheets of cloth <laughs> and you would wrap one of those rectangles around your waist you would wrap one of those rectangles around your upper body and then you would wear the third one as a kind of shawl or a cloak in that way but they were just three rectangular pieces of cloth and you would be given a begging bowl to go around every day begging for food and a part of that early buddhist tradition was that there was no keeping leftovers, there was no refrigerator, no pantry, meaning every single day, part of the daily routine was getting up and going and finding something to eat that might take all morning. Of course, there was a rule in early Buddhism, and there still is a rule for a lot of monastic traditions about not eating after noon, not eating after midday, so eating only one meal a day. And again, the primary thing was that you did not have a home. Now, eventually what would happen in the world of early Buddhism is that they would eventually begin constructing these, mm, they're sometimes called viharas, they would eventually, for the rainy season, so just for three months out of the year, they would construct these sort of temporary shelters for the rain. And then the early Buddhists would take up residence for the three month rainy season retreat. So they would hole up for a little while. But of course, this temporary shelter that they built, it was not considered to be any, anybody's house. It wasn't the Buddha's house. It wasn't any particular monk or nun's house. It was just a shelter that they built to all gather under to meditate during the rainy season retreat. And then in the early days, after the retreat was over, they'd go on their way, go wandering to the next town, go wandering around. It does happen, by the way, that these temporary structures, the viharas, it does actually happen that pretty early on, I think this even happens in the lifetime of the Buddha, but I'm not exactly sure, but very early on, these viharas, well, they do eventually start leaving one monk in the vihara to kind of watch over it so that it'll, it will still be there next year for the next rainy season retreat. So you do get the eventual creation of what we would call monasteries, but it's a kind of a slow process that happens over time. And again, no particular monk or nun or even the Buddha would claim the vihara as their property or as something that is theirs. Because indeed, that was the kind of the mandate. That was the rule, which is non-ownership. Not owning anything, even the robes, even the bowl were considered to be on loan. <laughs> you were, they were not considered to be your bowl or your robes. You were just borrowing them. And by the way, I, will, I would like you to know that, so I've had the fortune of spending a fair amount of time in Buddhist monasteries and not Southeast Asian Theravada Hinayana monasteries, but actually more East Asian, Chinese, Taiwanese, and Japanese um, uh, Mahayana monasteries. I won't get into the specifics of the sects or the schools, but 
Mahayana Buddhist monasteries. And I was actually really, uh, I wouldn't say I was surprised, but I was actually delighted in speaking with the monastics there. I was really impressed to hear how many of them, in fact, one of the things that that kind of shocked me, the, not shocked me, but that I was really impressed by was that the monastics, they, they didn't claim ownership of anything, including their prescription glasses. And I thought that that was really interesting because, of course, a pair of prescription glasses, they're for you, like they're, they're for your eyes. So the degree to which the monastics that I was around, the degree to which they really observed this mentality of non-ownership, I was really impressed by it in the modern world in that way. So I do want you to know, want you all to know that that, of course, was the early part of, or the early practice of Buddhism was about renunciation and non-ownership. And insofar as there is a monastic path in many Mahayana forms of Buddhism, so like Zen Buddhism offers a monastic path, the Tibetan Buddhist tantric tradition offers a monastic path. In fact, they all basically offer a monastic path. And that monastic path does promote non-ownership. And they still, of course, most Buddhist monks and nuns to this day, still shave their head, still only wear robes, although I have definitely seen some pretty nice, uh, uh, let's call it evening wear on some of the monks. So, you know, but my point is, is that there is this monastic path, and it stems from the early form of Buddhism. Okay. Now, before I kind of get into the what does leaving home mean for the Mahayana, mean for a bodhisattva? Well, before I get too into that, I do want to say one more thing about that early path. So I already mentioned it at the beginning of the talk that the Hinayana, as it's called, the early form of Buddhism, it is a path of individual liberation. And what that basically means, let me, and I'm going to just, you know, these are broad brush strokes of this form of Buddhism. But basically, of course, we're talking about what is known as the Visuddhi Magga, the path of purification. That is what Buddhism is sort of all about in a way. And in particular, when they talk about purification, they are referring to three afflictions of the mind. What are usually just called greed, anger, and delusion. Greed is, you know, I always think greed is not quite right. We're talking about desire, craving, addiction, like wanting but needing, that's the idea of greed in that sense. And then of course, being greedy in terms of not sharing, all of that is this one affliction of the mind. Then there's the problem of anger, which usually stems from not getting what we want, but there's all kinds of ways in which the human being, and in fact, all sentient creatures are cranky. <laughs> angry in that way. So those are two afflictions of the mind, greed and anger, but they stem from an underlying confusion or delusion. And that confusion or that delusion is about a certain way of thinking about the self. And, you know, most of you know this already, of course, but Buddhism is a teaching of no self. Now, I'm not here to do a whole talk about no self, so I don't want to get too into that, but it is important to remember that a kind of delusion about the nature of the self 
from the Buddhist point of view, that is what is causing us to be like, give me that, give me that. That'll make me happy. That'll make me happy. Or get that away from me. You get away from me. Ah. So the idea is, is all the anger and all the desire are stemming from a confusion about the self that thinks it's going to be happy with this stuff or that thinks it's going to be satisfied if it expresses anger. But then after it expresses anger, it's still not satisfied. And even after it gets the stuff, it just wants more stuff. So that underlying self is confused about what pleasure is, about what all of this is about. So Buddhism, the path of purification, is about weeding out the condition of needing and wanting, weeding out anger, subsiding, getting rid of anger, and then ultimately becoming awakened to the real nature of the self. And if you do that, you kind of diminish and get rid of greed, anger, and confusion, delusion, then you are now pure, purified. And this process can take a while because these habits, these conditionings of ours, the conditioning to need and want stuff, the conditioning, the, the reactionary condition of getting angry, these are very deep-seated aspects of being a human being. So these are not just something that one decides to get rid of, like, oh, yeah, you're right, Buddha, I'm done with those. It doesn't work like that. It could take not just a while, it could even take lifetimes of practice to ultimately purify oneself of those three afflictions. Now, the point is, though, is that in the Hinayana, in that early path, it was about your greed, your anger, and your confusion or delusion. And so all the meditation, all the study, all the practice, all the cultivation, it's all to get rid of you or my greed, anger, and delusion. And then in the early tradition, if you succeed in this lifetime of becoming purified, which a, a fully purified being in this tradition is called an arahat, if you make it to the state of an arhat, then you can go around and show yourself to people and they can make offerings to you. <laughs> That's the early path. If you are successful in clearing out your bad habits, your afflictions, then you become this purified field of blessings, they're called, a punya kshetra, in which now people can run up to you and they can bow and pray, or they can make offerings to you, or you can just gaze upon them. In India, this is called darshan, like just gazing upon a purified being. And the idea was, is that that's what the arahat had to offer society. Look at me, I'm purified, kind of an idea. And all of that, the best in a way that that could result in is somebody being inspired by your comportment, by the way you carry yourself. You, you could inspire someone to leave home and go and join a monastery, but then they would be on the path of purification for themselves. So that's kind of the way the early tradition worked. And in terms of this situation that I set up, where there's a purified arahat, and then someone making offerings to them, 
this is what they call the Buddhist and the lay person. And in the early Buddhist tradition, a lay person was not exactly considered a real Buddhist. It was the monastic, the monk or the nun, who was considered the Buddhist, not the lay person. And the reason why the lay person wasn't considered kind of a real Buddhist is because they hadn't left home. So that kind of sets up this kind of dichotomy in early Buddhism between lay and monastic. And then, of course, what it means to be a monastic in that sense is to have left home. So <clears throat> there's a lot I could actually say about leaving home, meaning becoming a monastic. The main thing that I want to focus on, because I don't want to, it's like I'm not here to, to like throw the Hinayana under the bus, as they say. Like I'm really not here to put down that path, but I do want to juxtapose it to the Bodhisattva path. So I kind of have to set up this, this situation like this, but I do want to really recognize that to leave home in the traditional sense of shaving your head and joining a monastery, like the actual kind of giving up the home life, it's very noble. I don't know what else to say about it. I want to give my absolute full respect to anyone who, who does that. And I want to kind of pay my respects to that, that lifestyle because... Well, in many ways, because of what I'm about to say about the Bodhisattva path. So the idea is, and so now I'm kind of, you know, zooming out a little bit to transition to talk about Mahayana Buddhism, but just zooming out, we want to, or I'm, th I've been thinking about, I've been thinking about this today, getting kind of prepared for this Dharma talk and the thing that I want to kind of really emphasize is like, it's about a sort of, mm, it's like, it's one, so let, you know, let's say you're stressed out or let's say you're anxious, you know, whatever it is, you, you got, you got some, some stuff on your mind, let's say. And then you hear about meditation. You hear about some Buddhist practices and you're like, oh, you know, that could really probably help me, you know, get a good night's sleep or help me calm down or whatever it might be, whatever it might be. And what I'm getting at is, is that there is, this is the beauty of Buddhism. The beauty of Buddhism is that it has something to offer everyone in that way. But the All right, I'm going to answer that question in a second, Renata. So in this sort of, I'm still kind of in this zoomed out mode where it's sort of about, I guess I would call it dabbling, like dabbling in Buddhism. And again, the idea is, is that you might have like, you know, you might have bills to pay, you might have a job that's demanding a lot of you. You might have family members that are demanding a lot of you. You might have pets <laughs> that are demanding a lot of you. And so the idea is, is that, you know, all of that is, is too much. It's a lot to juggle. And so you decide, oh, I'll start a nice little meditation practice. And I'll meditate, you know, hour a day or whatever, half hour a day, whatever. And you begin to notice, you're like, oh, this is nice. It's like helping me sleep better. It's making more, more calm. And it's therefore making me better at my job, making me better at paying my bills on time, making me better at all of these things that are involved in the household life. And again, I, I said it, 
Buddhism, that's great. Buddhism has something to offer every station of life in that way. And so these, these meditation practices are powerful and they can kind of really help in that way. But the reason why I want to pay my respects to the renunciant, the monastic, the leaving home in that way, it's, it marks a major turning point in one's life. And what I mean is, is that to leave home marks a major turning point in what one's life is all about in that way. So I guess what I'm saying is, is that for anybody to actually take monastic vows and to leave home in that way, they're going all in. And that level of commitment to me, for me, Michael, commands total respect, that kind of really taking this seriously in that way. So that's where I kind of didn't want to just leave that hanging out. I wanted to, you know, not, I didn't want to make it sound like I was putting down the monastic path in that way. All right, so Renata has an interesting question. She asks if there were historical reasons at the time that a more outward looking path towards the greater good for all was rather than just oneself that was desired. Like, so were there historical reasons? And Renata, I've said this before, I won't go too into it, but it's not so much historical reasons. It's actually philosophical doctrinal reasons that the early Buddhist path was focused on individual liberation because as far as the philosophy and the doctrines go like the as far as the underlying teachings go we can only affect our own situation so let me renata really quickly a very classic early buddhist way of describing this they often say that when I eat, it doesn't satisfy your hunger. So what that means is, is that my karmic situation is my karmic situation. And so if I meditate, it can only help me. How could my meditation help your liberation? In the early Buddhist tradition or the early Buddhist thinking about karma, it does not compute that I could somehow affect your liberation. Again, the best I could do is encourage you to come join us out in the forest. In the Mahayana tradition, there is actual philosophical reasons to, or there are philosophical doctrinal reasons that point to how our very existences, us right here, right now in this Zoom call, having this class, our existences right now are karmically bound up together. You're thinking about what I'm saying. I'm looking at all of you. I'm listening to your comments. I'm reading your comments. So my very being is infused and includes all of you right now and it includes of course my family my neighbors everything so because in the mahayana tradition they have such an emphasis on what is called the interconnectedness of all dharmas it's actually very very possible for my mental state to affect your mental state in fact, that's exactly what is happening right now in that way. And so there is a, a deep understanding in the Mahayana that a that one individual in that sense can affect the enlightenment of others. Because we certainly affect each other's ignorance in that way. So it might as well be able to affect each other's enlightenment too. So. Okay, so, all right, great, Renata. Okay, so 
now shifting gears, I want to talk about leaving home for the Bodhisattva. So the Mahayana tradition is very interesting. And it's interesting because, as I already mentioned, many of the schools of Mahayana Buddhism, they offer a, a traditional monastic path where you shave your head and wear robes and don't have a home and you're celibate and all of that. But what's nice about the Mahayana tradition and what's nice about the Bodhisattva path is that it's very, very well understood that that way of doing it, where you like don't have a job and don't have bills and don't have all that responsibility, it's it's understood in the Mahayana that that, that might be the most expedient path for someone. And therefore, that's the right path for them. But it doesn't mean that it's the only path. And that's what begins to make the Mahayana the Mahayana. The emphasis on what is called upaya, skillful means or expedient means. We've been talking about upaya in Dharma doors on Sunday nights now for weeks and months. And now we're looking at all of these different teachings and these different practices and these different lifestyles. They're all upaya. And what that means, what upaya means is that what is expedient for one person might not be expedient for another person but it doesn't rule out that original path of no bills, no kind of worldly responsibilities in that way, which again, for some people, that's very appealing. Now, for the Bodhisattva path, and I'm going to allude to a sutra that we read last year. So last year, I read a different sutra from this book, which was about a bodhisattva named Manjushri. And it was the sutra about the bodhisattva Manjushri's enlightenment. And in that sutra, it's another one of those sutras that kind of zigs and zags all over the place. But in that sutra, there's a teaching given. And this teaching is given in many Mahayana sutras. I just refer to that one because we read it not too long ago. And what's interesting about the Bodhisattva path is this, and it, it speaks a lot about M Mahayana Buddhism in general. So what the Buddha says in that sutra is, hey, Ed, great to see you. So what the Buddha says in that sutra, and again, I'm going to have to like, move through a lot of ideas quickly because we're not here to talk about them. But the basic idea of the Bodhisattva's relationship to the home life is the Buddha basically describes it in terms of being attached to and needing and wanting and craving these creature comforts of the household life versus not clinging, needing, wanting, or craving these things of the household life. And the Buddha basically tells a bodhisattva that to not cling to, to, not, to be not attached to the household life, that's leaving home. And what's interesting about that is that that bodhisattva may still have a roof over their heads, may still have bills to pay, may still have all these other things, but their emotional disposition towards all the things is that they don't need it. They don't want it in that way. And this is, again, this is a major divergence within the world of Buddhism, but it speaks to 
the essence of Mahayana Buddhism. The essence of Mahayana Buddhism is a recognition that, well, I'll put it to you this way. The Mahayana tradition recognizes that there are these various things in this world that are causes of desire. Things like sexuality, that's a big one that, of course, Buddhism deals with, is the over-needing and over-wanting and over-craving of sexuality. But also things like intoxication, <clears throat> of course, different things. But let's take, just for simplicity's sake, let's take sexuality. So let's say that someone is just, has a very high libido, as they would say, like really, really uh, desirous of sexuality. And let's say that they are wise enough to recognize that that preoccupation is compromising the rest of their life. They're spending way too much time online. They're spending way too much time obsessing about sexuality and all of that over here that other aspects of their life are being compromised and in jeopardy in that way. And they say, you know what, this, this has to stop. I'll join a monastery, right? So this really kind of reactionary thing of like, okay, I'll shave my head and I'll join a monastery. So in the early Buddhist tradition that I was describing in the first part of the talk, sexuality, like those that we are attracted to, pornography, whatever it is, like all of that was uh, unwholesome, akushala dharma, unwholesome dharmas. And so in the early Buddhist tradition, it was get, get away from unwholesome dharmas. Come out to the forest. All we have are mangoes out here. Come on, it's pure out in the forest. And so there's this idea of like, oh yeah, all of that's defiled. I'm going to go over there. Well, what the Mahayana tradition recognizes is that if that person leaves the household life and they go to the forest monastery and they're just sitting there obsessing about sexuality and fantasizing and all of that, it doesn't matter if they're out in the woods. The problem is the mind. And this is the major difference in Mahayana Buddhism. Mahayana Buddhism says there's nothing wrong or evil about these things. The only thing that's wrong or that the only thing that could be wrong, the only thing that could be defiled is the mind. And so from that Mahayana point of view, it's not the house, the shelter, the bills, the mortgage. It's not all of that that's the problem. It's the mentality that needs it, that craves it, that wants it. And by the way, too, you can reflect on this. It's the mentality that lives in fear of losing it all. That is the mental affliction that the Mahayana tradition wants to resolve. So they're not particularly interested in vilifying alcohol or sexuality or anything. Things for, for the Mahayana tradition, those are just things. Things like other things. What the problem is, is that with the mind that is too overly attached to them or desirous of them in that way. So for the bodhisattva, for the Mahayana, to actually let go of all those things mentally, that is the path of purification. And 
at first, when you know, I kind of I tried to be strategic about this Dharma talk. I always do, but this one I tried to be tricky. And the idea was is that I wanted to make leaving home as a as a renunciant. I wanted to build that up and pay my respects to it. I wanted to do that to sort of get, I wanted you to think like, yeah, that's pretty hardcore. Oh yeah, that's both feet in. Oh yeah, that's that's like really, really hardcore. But I only wanted to emphasize that to then shift the spotlight over to the bodhisattva. And I want us to recognize that to actually let go of the craving and the needing of these household things, but to still be in their presence, that is way crazier, harder, more difficult than renown. All of a sudden, not paying any bills, not having any response, not having to do laundry, not all of those things the monastic path starts to sound like the, the easy way out in that sense. But I know as someone who has, you know, been in the world of Buddhism for a long time, I know that the bodhisattva path is sometimes presented as like the, you know, the lay Buddhist path, that it's like somehow not as noble as the monastic path. I would beg to differ. I would suggest that actually letting go of all of these things, the attachment, that is much harder than the kind of walking away from it all, but perhaps still mentally needing it or wanting it or craving it in that sense. So, and again, I would really, really want to emphasize, like if you're, if you're kind of, reflecting on your own relationship to your environment, to your living situation and all of that, I would really want you to kind of as a form of vipassana, as a form of insight and inquiry, it's really about being honest about what I said regarding how would you react if you lost it all, if your world would be devastated, if your world, if, if that would be the worst thing, then that speaks to a degree of attachment and needing of these things. But again, and I'm not, I'm not trying to point the finger at anybody. This is, this is really about our own psychology and that. Uh, yeah, so uh, Maria had a question about impermanence and emptiness. And indeed, as I mentioned in a lot of these Dharma talks, the early form of Buddhism that I've been talking about has been is focused on impermanence, things not lasting, things decaying, things being ephemeral. And so better not get too attached to them because they're impermanent. An idea that I didn't talk about earlier, but I almost started to talk about was emptiness. That's part of the Bodhisattva's realization about all of these creature comforts and all of these things of the house. The Bodhisattva realizes that they are all empty to begin with. They are all ultimately linguistic fictions and as being empty and just linguistic, uh, just linguistic fictions in that way, if the mind, if the bodhisattva can understand emptiness, and I, I apologize for not launching into my normal uh, diatribe about emptiness, but if the mind can understand emptiness, then it is very easy to let go of that which doesn't exist. So that's sort of a, a, an additional part of the bodhisattva path is the contemplation of emptiness versus impermanence in that way. By the way, I always like to share this. Um, so 
in in the Islamic tradition, which I I don't have I don't quote a lot from the Islamic tradition. I respect the Islamic tradition, but it's just sort of its own its own thing in that way that doesn't really have a lot of overlap with Buddhism. Um, I talk a lot more about early Christianity because early Christianity actually has a lot of interesting overlaps with Buddhism. But there is one quote from the Islamic tradition that I really appreciate. And it, it, it pertains to this topic that we're talking about here tonight. So I have heard it said, but I have yet to find the surah or the quote or the hadith or, you know, I don't know where this comes from, but it has been quoted to me. So I quote it back to you. But in the Islamic tradition, hell Hell is described as having everything that you're attached to in this life stacked on top of your head for eternity. And I think that that is such a Buddhist quote because it speaks to, wow, so if you're attached to your house and your cars and you're this and you're that and you're that, boom, boom right? Whereas if you're not attached to anything, is it even hell? Because there's nothing on top of you in that way. So I like that quote from the Islamic tradition about hell is having everything that you're attached to stacked on top of your head. You know, so there's a lot of different, um, traditions that I could draw from to kind of point to this topic about, oh, sort of being mired, mired in the world, mired in the things of life in that way. And then these two different approaches to freeing ourselves from that weight, either literally giving it all up in that way and going and joining a monastery, or actually just overcoming our attachments to it all. Yeah, no. Hey, Michael, I have a question about the, the what you've just been talking about, about renouncing everything being a relatively easier path in some ways that you just described versus being in the world and still being detached or or a non-craving, but um, the question is about other human beings and relationships in particular. The, the, to me, that seems like, on the one hand, the much harder part of being in the world is, okay, I'm supposed to practice right speech in a monastery. That's pretty easy, <laughs> you know, out in the world, it's like I have to you know, up against that every single day. And that to me makes the practice more arduous. Although I do know a couple of folks who have been monastics for a long time. And I think in, in let's see, one is a Zen, was Zen and one was uh, like more of a Theravadan tradition. And in they described that the relationships amongst the monastics was still a huge thing to deal with even even if they didn't speak to each other there were the th there were there were the thoughts of oh there there goes noam he's you know taking too much rice or whatever it is you know that they still had that relational stuff going on in, in the monastery so i just wondered about your thoughts on those yeah i i hear what you're i hear what you're saying and this does get tricky in the modern world for a variety of reasons. Um, when I when I was in graduate school, when I was doing my master's degree, there was actually a, a Taiwanese nun who was in my department uh, getting her master's degree as well. So we had a bunch of great conversations. And, you know, yes, she was a renunciant in that way, but she also then aspired to get into graduate school. We were both trying to get into PhD programs. She really, really wanted to get into PhD programs, was stressing and 
uh, pulling out her non-existent hair, trying to get into these programs. And so, of course, like you join a monastery, but then there's going to be those problems as well, whether they be interpersonal problems or just aspects of being a modern creature. Um, my friend Sukai, the, the nun, she had a credit card, had credit card bills, was racking up student debt, and it worried her, at least it seemed to worry her in that way. So, yeah, I think it's more, I think it's more about a path of, like, you know, I speak often about the relationship or the overlap with Buddhism and recovery. So there's a lot of overlap between people in recovery or trying to overcome alcohol or addiction and Buddhism. And I think that it is a thing that for some, it, it has to be a hard break. It has to be this, in, you know, real removal from the situation. Whereas I think for others, it can be, or it doesn't require that hard break in that way. And it can be managed more um, in the world in that sense. So, yeah, I mean, I, I hear your, what you're saying, Noam, about that idea of being a, a, a monastic has its problems as well. So, yeah. Cool. Um, all right. So I think I've said a lot, actually, more than I kind of intended. So let's jump back into our sutra and just read a little bit. I want to share with you a few things. So if you recall, we're reading this section where these different uh, significant moments in the life of the, of the Buddha are being recounted, but they are being asked in terms of, but why? Why did these things happen? So, for example, um, I'm going to skip over a few. Yeah, actually, I'm going to skip over a few that I didn't go over last week, but they still deal with... Well, actually, I'll read you this one to get us started. So the Buddha has just been born. And if you recall, the Buddha was born in a secluded place called the Lumbini Garden, which is near Nepal. Or I think it's even in Nepal. And then the next question we get is, so why did the Bodhisattva go back to the palace after he was born in the secluded place? instead of just going immediately to the Bodhi tree and becoming enlightened? Well, in order to let his body fully develop, he appeared to live in the palace and he appeared to amuse himself with the five sensual pleasures. Then he appeared to give up the four continents and leave the household life. Also, in order to convert other people so that they might abandon the five sensual pleasures, shave their beards and ha hair, don monastic robes and leave the household life, the Bodhisattva went instead of going immediately to the Bodhi tree after he was born in a secluded place. And this was all just an upaya of the Bodhisattva. So the question is, after the Buddha was born, why didn't he just charge right to the Bodhi tree and become enlightened? And it was about, oh, he appeared to go back and live a life in a palace and enjoy himself. But that was for our benefit. That was an upaya of the Buddha. So there's more of these. And I'm tempted to... Well, I'll do one more that fits in with the topic here tonight. So, when in the palace, why did the Bodhisattva thoroughly learn to read, to debate, to play chess, 
Why did he learn archery, chariot driving, strategy, planning, and various arts and techniques? Well, because he wanted to follow mundane conventions. There was nothing in the entire universe which the Bodhisattva did not already know. When he was born, he was already conversant with all such things as poetry, speech, debate, incantations, drama, singing, dancing, music, and craftsmanship. This was all just an upaya of the Bodhisattva. So the one thing I meant to say, and this was an important thing, so apologies for this, but that, that just jogged my memory. It just reminded me. So when I was making my opening remarks, I was mentioning that the life story of the Buddha, it goes from being a, in a historical account of the founder of the religion to being an archetypal journey for the Bodhisattva. Well, the reason why I actually meant to say that and why I wanted to point that out about the archetypal journey, well, it has to do with if one has taken the bodhisattva vow, if one consider the, considers themselves on the path, the bodhisattva path, then what we're reading about is this archetypal journey that you're going to go through as a bodhisattva. I already mentioned, you've already entered your mother's womb. You've already exited your mother's womb. You've already been born. You've already done those things. So what I'm getting at is, is that it might not be today. It might not be tomorrow or next week or next month. It might not even be this lifetime. But as a bodhisattva, on your bodhisattva path, you will eventually leave home. And of course, the one thing I wanted to emphasize is that when I say that, I am not saying that you one day will renounce and shave your head and become a monastic. What I am saying, though, is that part of being on the bodhisattva path is one day leaving home. But what I mean by that is that idea of one day, you'll get over it. You will be satisfied. In fact, it's what they talk about with the bodhisattvas. It's a beautiful uh, way of putting it. It's about being sated. It's about being satisfied. And what I mean by that is it's a moment in the bodhisattva's life in the bodhisattva path where as far as all of this you know whatever it is entertainment drugs whatever it is there reaches a certain point where the bodhisattva is like you know what i'm good i'm good with all of that i'm sated i'm satisfied and it is at that moment then that there is this calling or this step of leaving home where, again, you're done with all of that. And you might still have a house. You might still have a mortgage. You might still have all the bills and all of that. But the idea would be, so for, I want to try to make this a little bit practical. The idea for the bodhisattva in particular, if the bodhisattva had had pets, had family members, had other members of their household, the mentality of the bodhisattva that is interested in paying their bills on time and making sure that there's a roof over our head, the idea is, is that the bodhisattva could be satisfied, meaning the bodhisattva it's like, I don't need a house, I don't need whatever, but in order to protect and take care of all of these people or all of these creatures or all of that, then the bodhisattva might keep a mortgage. The bodhisattva might have a house, but the mentality is that it's not for me. In fact, as a bodhisattva, I don't need or want this really. 
but I will still maybe work, make money, pay bills to create a safe environment for my family or what have you. So I really wanted to emphasize that tonight. It was kind of the theme tonight, that idea that at some point, a bodhisattva leaves home. And there's just a number of different ways to understand what that could mean. And I really think that it'll, it, it does mean something different to everybody in that way. For, for many people, in, in particular, I'll mention this. In the early Buddhist path where we were literally leaving home, it had a lot to do with cutting off family ties. So if you didn't know this, when you left home in the early days, not only did you give up the domicile, like the actual physical structure, but you also gave up your name, in particular, your last name. So you were cutting ties with the family. That's a big part of leaving the household life or leaving home is actually that cutting off of uh, relationship and ties with the family. Now, again, I want to emphasize that's an aspect of the early renunciatory path. Every monastic I have ever met, except for a few who were, who were orphans, but every other monastic I've ever met has relationship with their parents. So I want you to know that in the modern world, this aspect of Buddhism doesn't seem to have stuck. But in the early days, a big part of leaving home was not having anything to do with the family anymore. Now, in the Bodhisattva path, again, that could be very different. As, we've, uh, as we're saying regarding having a house or even having a job and so on. But in terms of what I'm talking about, about the archetypal journey of a bodhisattva leaving home and that moment when they are, they're good, they're satisfied with worldly things, they don't need any more worldly things because they've had enough of worldly things. Well, another way to think about leaving home for a bodhisattva as it pertains to the family is it could be about, you know, like if you're, if you're in your 20s, let's say, and you are still sort of very dependent upon your parents and maybe even, you know, I don't want to, it's not about where you live or whatever, but just that, that mentality of still being their child, that mentality and having those kind of uh, parental relationships that keep one in a childlike state. Well, a bodhisattva leaving home might for someone, it might be about cutting off those ties and actually leaving that sense of shelter. But again, what I'm getting at is, is that what it means to leave home could be different for everybody in that way. Okay, so I just wanted to make sure I said all of that. Any comments, questions, ideas about anything so far? Okay. So let's read a little bit more. So I think what I'm going to do, yeah, so if you've been reading along and we've been reading this one now for weeks, I'm skipping a major section. And what I'm going to skip is a few weeks ago now, I think, I forget exactly when it happened, but there was a question posed to the Buddha. And what it was, was, is it said, hey, Buddha, in a past life, long time ago, kalpas ago, when you were still just a, an ascetic, you were still just a wandering ascetic, and there was a Buddha in the world named Kyashapa. And at that time, when you were still just an ascetic, you said this really mean thing about Kashyapya, the Buddha. You said, 
uh, what, something to the effect of no bald-headed person could ever achieve awakening. And there was a question a long time ago about wh why did you seemingly slander Buddha Kashepa? Well, that's actually what started this whole thing about, well, the Buddha just appeared to enter his mother's womb and the Buddha just appeared to do these things. He actually wasn't, he wasn't defiled by any of these things is the gist of the sutra. So this goes on for pages and pages and pages and pages until we finally get the backstory on why did the Buddha call Kashyapya a bald head? And it's a long, complicated story that I, I won't, I'm not going to read the whole thing. But basically what happened was, is that there was these five other ascetics who the Buddha, who revered Kashyapya. But the Buddha was trying to get these five ascetics to go listen to what Kashyapya Buddha was saying. And so he devised, it's a complicated scheme, by the way, but he devised this plan where basically the five other ascetics would overhear him talking bad about this Buddha, and that through a series of events, that would lead them to go listen to what he had to say. And therefore, it was okay that the Buddha seemingly slandered Kashyapa Buddha because his intentions were in the right place, because his intention was to try to get these five ascetics to go listen to what he was saying. So it was kind of a situation of like reverse psychology in that way. And before, you know, before you go judging the Buddha and being like, oh, you know, was that a, a decent way? You know, he, he was basically kind of lying or being, you know, seemingly deceitful in that way. In terms of like the old reverse psychology, Many, many, many parents have used the old reverse psychology to get their children to do things that are in their best interest. So the parent has nothing but love and kindness and compassion for the child, only wants what's best for the child. Knowing that the child isn't going to listen to this a parent might be upayak. A parent might employ an upaya and, per, and you know, do a little reverse psychology and sort of trick the kid into doing what is for their own best interest. That is basically the kind of the message of a lot of these uh, sections that we've been reading about upaya. It's all about the intention. And if the intention is there, which is to be compassionate and kind and loving and helpful in that way, then there's what we're being told, according to this sutra, is that, you know, right and wrong are a little flexible depending upon your intention. And this, of course, becomes a foundation of Buddhist ethics. It's not exactly Western ethics in that way. Western ethics, which comes out of the Christian tradition, is a little bit more focused on the act, whereas the intention, mm, you know, is sort of neither here nor there. It, it's a factor, but for Western ethics, it's more about the event or the act. Buddhism, and even in East Asia, ethics are a little different. It's sort of these more relative ethics in that way. Again, it's based upon the intention. So, all right. So I'm skipping over that long backstory, but I did want to say, I wanted to get to this one just to be able to talk about it. So. After these, 
actually, I'll read you this one really quickly. The one after the backstory about Kashyapya Buddha. And by the way, I'm on page 448, if you have this book and would like to follow along, I'm towards the bottom. So the question is about why was the Bodhisattva absorbed in thought under the rose apple tree? And this is a reference to a story that, again, it's a part of the life story of the Buddha. And it's about how the young Siddhartha sitting under a rose apple tree in the palace when he was still Prince Siddhartha. There's a story about how Siddhartha would often sit under that tree and drift into these meditative trances. Now, it would later be revealed to the Buddha by Alara Kalama, one of his teachers, that he was actually doing dhyana meditation practice, but didn't even know it. He didn't know what to call it, but that's what he was doing under the rose apple tree. So the question is, is that why was the Bodhisattva absorbed in thought under the rose apple tree? And it was because he wished to basically make a good influence on the other people of the palace. That's the answer here. But I just wanted you to know this little backstory about the Buddha, that he was sort of already an adept at meditating. And now, why did the Bodhisattva go forth from the city to observe things instead of just staying home and amusing himself with the five sensual pleasures? Now, this is a reference, and we're about to read it, but this is not the Buddha leaving home yet. This is actually the what are known as the four sights. When the Buddha, for the first time in his life, goes out of the palace and goes into the city and sees. So, why did the Bodhisattva go forth from the city to observe things instead of amusing himself with the five pleasures? Because he wished to show that he saw an old person. He wished to show that he saw a sick person, that he saw a dead person, and that he saw a meditating ascetic. That's why he went forth into the city. He wished his relatives to know that he had left the household life for fear of old age, illness, and death, but not out of arrogance. He wanted everybody to know that he left the household life in order to benefit his relatives, not to harm them. They wanted everybody to know that he left the household life because he saw the faults of the household life. In order to show all sentient beings the suffering of old age, illness, and death, the Bodhisattva went forth from the city to observe things instead of just staying home, amusing himself with the five sensuous pleasures. So I just kind of wanted to end tonight on that. Like, what was it that prompted Siddhartha to leave home? And if, of course, if you know the story of Siddhartha or you were just paying attention, you will know that for the first time in Siddhartha's life, when he was in his th uh, 20s, his late 20s, already married, just had a child. And for the first time that late in life, for the first time, he goes into the city and he sees an old person. If you don't know the story, the Buddha's father shielded him, protected him from seeing old age. So all of the, the palace attendants, all of the servants were always in the prime of life. And as soon as they started to get a little old, they were fired and replaced with new younger people. And the story is, is that even as his parents started to get older, they would just wear all this makeup to make themselves look younger. And then when they got too old, they just wouldn't let Siddhartha see them anymore. So this shielded Siddhartha from even knowing 
about the aging process, for even knowing about getting old. They also, his parents also shielded him from knowing about illness. If anybody in the palace was ill, they were just moved away and they were never, you know, Siddhartha never saw them. And he never was taught or knew about getting ill. And the most important is, is that he was never told about dying. He didn't know. <laughs> he just thought it kind of went on forever in that way. Now, the fourth sight that the Buddha saw was an ascetic sitting in full lotus. And when the Buddha asked about that person, who's that? He said to his charioteer who told him about old age illness and death. And this charioteer said, oh, that guy? Well, he's trying to find a way of getting out of old age illness and death. And Siddhartha asked, is there a way out of old age illness and death? And his charioteer said, some people say there is. And that, the image of that meditating ascetic planted this seed in Siddhartha's mind that would then propel him to leave home. Now, as I mentioned earlier on, I love telling the story of Siddhartha. It's one of my favorite things to do. It's just such a powerful uh, um, narrative. But if you haven't heard it, or you haven't heard me tell it, or heard me talk about it, for me, the four sights, the old, per, old age, sickness, death, and then the wandering ascetic, the way that I understand that, the way that I think about that as a Buddhist practitioner, take old age. So I don't know about all of you, but I can speak for myself and that I know that for me, obviously I was not raised in a shielded palace in that way, right? I was... I was raised in the streets of Riverside, California, like everybody else in Riverside. And what I mean is, is that I, of course, knew about old age from the day I met my grandmother, right? And that she looked very different than my parents. But my point is, is that nobody shielded me from old age, knowing about old age. So it was very, very present in my life. But there was definitely a day when it got real. <laughs> there was a day when it occurred to me, and I couldn't tell you exactly how old I was or exactly what happened, but there was a day when this getting old thing got real. <laughs> and it was no longer like, something that happened to other people. It was no longer something that was just theoretical. It was like, oh, wow, I'm getting old. And there's a way that, you know, in a, in a beautiful way, there's a way that youth, right? Like what, what's the old saying, right? That youth is wasted on the youth, right? But that state of being a young person and feeling immortal, feeling like, you you know, not just old age is for other people. It, that's a beautiful state of oblivion, right, in that sense. And what I'm getting at is, is that because I already think of the story of Siddhartha as the archetypal journey of a bodhisattva, that archetypal journey it kind of begins in that way when the bodhisattva is like, whoa, this old age thing is really happening. It's, it's actually real. This is not theoretical. Even more is illness. Now, obviously, I got sick as a kid. People around me were sick. But everybody got better. <laughs> 
So illness was like this kind of also this thing that I knew about, but it was like, you know, oh, whatever, you get a cold, right? You get this, you get that, right? And so illness has a way of being kind of theoretical or being whatever until, until a beloved one gets a diagnosis, right? Gets diagnosed with a severe illness. And all of a sudden, uh, sorry, I'm getting a little choked up, but all of a sudden illness can get really real, really quickly in that way. And of course, death. The most sort of, you know, you know, again, the youth, you got to love them, right? But I remember my own self when I was young and the way that, you know, I would draw skulls on my folder in school and I was kind of like, you know, death was cool. Death was hardcore. Death was edgy, right? So there was a way in which as, as a youth, death was this whatever, you know? But then as time goes on and as old age gets real and as illness gets real, there comes a moment in everybody's life. And, you know, I really do wish people, you know, that everybody has spared this as long as possible, actually. But it, you know, because it's terrible when these things get, you know, dumped on somebody too young, right? Where they suffer loss very young or they suffer illness very young. But the idea is, is that there reaches a certain point where death is very real. It's a very real concern. And again, my feeling about the story of Siddhartha going to the city and seeing these things, I read that, I understand that as these turning point moments in the development of any human being, when those things get real. And at that point, if you have really like seen old age, if you've really seen illness and you've really seen death, then this possibility, even just this possibility of not suffering old age, illness, and death, there's a way in which that, that mission or that project to not suffer old age, illness, and death, there's a way that that project can become the most important project. And all these other things, all this other worldly stuff is like Legos. It's just a game. It's just playtime. But the old age illness and death and dealing with that, that's the real serious business. And again, when, when someone's mind has come to that, when they've seen old age illness and death and they've realized, you know what, I might take, start taking spirituality, religion, whatever you want to call all this, that idea of like, you know what? I want to start, start taking that more seriously. You're on the Bodhisattva path. That's the idea. So, and on that note of being on the Bodhisattva path, I'm going to call it a night. I want to thank you, everybody, as usual, for listening to me rant. Appreciate it. Oh, what a beautiful rant. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Um, Maria, you mean the book I've re been reading from? Uh, yeah, Maria, just let me know which book you're referring to, and I'll tell you for sure. Uh, that's a great point, Renata. Renata had a great point about sort of with modern medicine and surgeries and stuff, there's a way that we can these days sort of avoid old age longer really good point and it's kind of kind of what i'm talking about in that way of sort of continuing to live in denial of it versus that moment of embr not embracing it but accepting it in that sense <laughs>
Ah, so yeah, Maria. So every Sunday night um, for a very long time, I've been reading from this book and it's called A Treasury of Mahayana Sutras. And it's a partial translation of the Maharatnakuta collection of sutras. It's by Penn State University Press. Uh, Garam C.C. Chang would be the editor. So yeah, so this is what we read from every Sunday night. It's one of my favorite collections of sutras. Thanks, Ed. So great to see you. Great to see everybody. Oh, uh, by the way, before um, Noam even asks me, I am going to mention real quick, um, if you're into sutras and you're into our Dharmador Sutra study, this coming Thursday, so on April, I guess, 6th, I'm starting a new course. It's my own course. It's an eight-week study of the longer Pranyaparamita Sutra. If you have heard of the Heart Sutra and heard of the Diamond Sutra, well, this is the next one. So this is the next of the Pranyaparamita Sutras. I teach courses on the Heart Sutra and the Vajra or the Diamond Sutra. And now I'm going to teach this new course. So that's going to be on Thursday nights, 7 to 8.30 p.m. That's specific. And you can go to lotusunderground.com, which is my website, if you would like to find out more about that. So just want to put that in there real quick.